Okay, so here we are. This is uh, lesson number two in the series uh, Elders, Preachers, Deacons, Saints. Uh, the title of this lesson is Church Leadership. And throughout this whole series, it's about leadership, uh, the aspect of leadership as it is expressed in various ways in the congregation, very much like Brother Dayton mentioned in his prayer. So uh, in our first lesson in the series uh, on uh, elders, preachers, deacons, saints, I, I looked mainly at the differences that determine um, these roles in the church, because people want to know what's the difference between one role and, a, and another role. And I showed that these are the um, only specific roles that the New Testament mentions. You know, I, I, I know that um, many of us come from different church backgrounds, I certainly do, you know, growing up Catholic and so on and so forth. And there are so many, quote, offices or official roles or leadership role in various denominations that have titles and names that you can't find in the, in the Bible, in the, new, uh, in the New Testament. So uh, what we're discussing are the only roles that are actually described uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, Testament, uh, Testament record. Now, we've not yet looked uh, deeply into any one of these roles. You know, I just, uh, last time it was our introductory lesson, so I just began with the, you know, the, just going over briefly each uh, particular uh, role. But I did show you that uh, these people have a specific function in the church based on uh, various, uh, uh, various uh, responsibilities, for example. The roles in the church are different. In other words, uh, elders are different than deacons, deacons uh, different than preachers, preachers different than saints, and so on and so forth, because of different responsibilities that each has. Each has a specific task uh, to fulfill. Uh, each has various aptitudes. Uh, the persons who function in these roles do so because they're qualified in specific ways. Elders are qualified in, in ways that deacons are not, and deacons are qualified in ways that uh, maybe saints are not, and so on and so forth. And as I say, we're going we're to dig a little deeper uh, into those differences as we go on. And then the third um, you know, specific function is the fact that each of these roles has an appointment. The Bible demonstrates that the men who serve, for example, as elders or preachers or deacons, are always appointed to their tasks <clears throat> by the church. There's no such thing as a self-appointed evangelist or a self of, you know, nobody wakes up one morning and say, you know, I, I like that job that those elders are doing. I think I'm going to appoint myself as an elder today. I'm going to let the church know that I, you know, I, feel like, I feel like I deserve to be an elder, so I'm just going to, be, you know, I'm going to become a shepherd. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And it also doesn't work that way, even if you've got a, you go to school and you get a PhD in religion or Bible or whatever, even that. Even that doesn't confer on you a, a specific appointment in the church to a specific role. It's the church that appoints, not colleges, not other institutions um, aside from the church. No parachurch organization has the authority to assign a particular role in the local church. All right, so today we're going to take a look, uh, dig down a little deeper, take a look at, um, at elders and the role that they play in the, in the church. Now, we know that leadership in the world takes on many forms and ex exercises authority in a lot of ways, and we've seen that. Haven't we seen you know, on TV a lot of, <laughs> what is it, a crisis of leadership, things going on in New York, for example. What is it, a crisis of leadership? Uh, a, a certain governor is, is being, uh, uh, indicted for a crime and now going to jail. You know, we, we see in our, in our media all the time uh, leaders uh, either not doing a good job or doing a good job, so it's, it's very important, right? They, they, they have authority. So uh, we see some leadership in the world uh, is either cruel or cunning with leaders who will sacrifice even their own people for um, maintaining personal power. We, we've seen that in the news, haven't we, in various countries where there are wars. Uh, other leaders are self-serving and, and, and proud. Still others are demonic or, or either benevolent. You know, there's all kinds of leaders in the world. Well, in the, same, the point I'm making here, in the, in the same way, uh, we're looking for a certain type of person to be a leader in the church. So regardless of the style, so long as there is you know, some form of leadership 
there is a measure of order and growth. Even in the worst of countries, you know, even in the communist countries, there's some sort of order because of the leadership that they have. Even if, even if we don't agree with their political point of view, even if they're cruel, even if they're totalitarian, uh, leadership does provide some sort of structure. Well, in the church, as an organization, we're, we're no different. We also have leadership, and without it, the church can't function and grow very well. And uh, I say that as someone who served as a missionary for many years in churches that don't have leadership, in churches that don't have uh, elders. And I want to tell you, anyone who ever complains about the elders, oh, I wish our elders were more this or more that, just try being in a church that has no elders, and you'll see the, you'll see the difference. Very difficult to grow uh, in a congregation that has uh, no, um, no eldership. So the leadership structure and style for the church is found in the New Testament and basically is as follows. First of all, um, the head or the leader is Jesus Christ. He's the head or the leader of the church. Paul uh, writes of this in, first, in Colossians 1.18, he says, he, referring to Jesus, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And I think the thing I want to specify about this, and we know this, I'm, you know, I'm not telling you things that, uh, that are brand new here, but there is a point I want to make, and that is that Jesus is the only head of the church. He doesn't share that headship with anyone else in heaven or on earth. You know, in uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 4, it says, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in the hope of your calling. So there's just one single body, right? One body and there's only one Lord, one head of that body and that's Jesus Christ. And, and we wonder why. Well, Matthew says, Jesus said, uh, or rather, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me, where? In heaven and on earth. So Jesus is the only head of the church in heaven, certainly, and on earth, certainly. Why? Because all authority has been given to Him. Whatever authority there is in heaven, whatever authority there is on earth, it's been given to Him. Uh, usually we notice in other uh, groups, other religious groups, you know, that call themselves churches, many times there's a leader a leader there that shares the leadership of that body with Christ, but the Bible does not give that type of authority to any person. Um, also, we see that Jesus exercises His leadership in a couple of ways. First of all, He exercises His leadership through His word. You know, you have a king, right? Let's say in the, in the older days, you, you, you have a king. How does that king exercise his authority? Well, he has an army. Now, he doesn't use his army all the time, but he has the army, and the army is at his disposal. And if you don't do what he says, he uses the army. That's how he exercises his authority, and he exercises his authority through taxation, for example, and through laws, and so on and so forth. Okay? Well, in the same way, Jesus exercises His authority and uh, He exercises it first and foremost through His word. Uh, in John chapter 12, 40, 48, Jesus says, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. So it is final. Uh, uh, the word is the final basis for judgment, the final um, a rule or measure for what is, you know, what is uh, according to God's will or not according to God's will. Uh, we also know that the word that he uses to exercise his authority is effective. Just like the king who has a powerful army, that powerful army is effective to get the king's will done. Well, Jesus' word is effective. And we know this uh, passage of scripture, familiar one in 2 Timothy 3, uh, and that from an early childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, all scripture is inspired by God, and here's the passage I'm looking for, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, 
for training, of, uh, training in righteousness so that the man of God be fully equipped, ready for every, uh, every good work. And so God's word is uh, able to save, able to help us, able to direct us, able to uh, help us understand the will and the purpose of the head of the body, which is, which is Christ. So that's one way he exercises his leadership. Another way he exercises his leadership is through his spirit. Uh, it is when we receive the Holy Spirit at baptism that we become disciples of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38, another familiar passage. Peter, in response to the crowd who had asked him, what should we do now? He's just preached the gospel to them. Uh, they, they're acknowledging that they are responsible for the death of, of Christ. And so they ask Peter, now what do we do? And Peter responds, well, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, I want to make a note here about that passage. A lot of times we either, we, we, we focus in on um, the baptism part, which is of course important, uh, how we should be baptized by immersion and that baptism is the correct response of faith to the gospel. Again, uh, we focus in on that a lot. We go to Acts 2.38 to prove that point. And so we should, that's what it says. And a lot of times uh, we also focus in on the forgiveness of your sins. You know, when are your sins forgiven? When you raise your hand and say, I believe in Jesus? Uh, well, the Bible says your sins are forgiven when you're baptized, so, and rightly so. We go to this passage as a proof text, if you wish, uh, to, uh, to demonstrate the idea that uh, forgiveness of sin, uh, uh, sins comes in the waters of baptism. But we go, we soft pedal the third thing. You, know, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, and by the way, you get the Holy Spirit too. You know, like as an afterthought, a bonus gift. You know, you, these are the important things. And then this little, you know, like women, they have, I see the ads in the paper. You know, if you buy this perfume that, that for one ounce, you know, $75 or $100, we give you this bonus gift, this huge bag of stuff with you know, brushes and combs and all that kind of hand cream. You know. So we treat this scripture like that. You know, well, you get, the forg and you, you, know, you, you get the forgiveness of sins and, and so on and so Oh, and by, by the way, you get this bonus thing. You get the Holy Spirit. But uh, we need to realize that the people who were listening to Peter there, the thing they were zeroing in on was not baptism, because that was a familiar thing to them. He wasn't saying anything new. John the Baptist had been talking about that. And they were familiar with the idea of you know, the use of water for purification. So they understood you know, the idea of baptism, and they understood the forgiveness of sins. I mean, John the Baptist was talking about this as well, to repent and so on and so forth. The thing they keyed on in uh, it was the Holy Spirit, because that's what Peter was talking about in, uh, uh, in quoting Joel the prophet, that the Spirit would be given to everyone when the Messiah came. You know, as far as the Jews were concerned, the Spirit came upon people you know, every once in a while, on a prophet, on a judge. You know, Isaiah said, I was in the spirit. You know what I'm saying? The spirit came upon me. David says, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You know, the spirit would come on individuals from time to time to enable them to do things. But the promise was that when the Messiah would come, everybody would get the spirit. Everyone would get it. Men, women, free, slave, you know, everybody would get it. And so when Peter says, repent of your sins, you know, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, the money shot was, and you will get the Holy Spirit like it was promised before. Everybody gets the Spirit. Okay, so I, I, want, I want us in, in our day and age to understand the importance of every part of that scripture because that's what they thought in, in their day. And so for the purpose of our lesson today, I said that Jesus exercises His headship, His leadership through His Spirit, which is in each Christian. So <clears throat> among other things, how does the Spirit lead us? 
Well, you know, we see from various passages, our, our ministries, right? The Spirit leads us in the church as far as the things that we do, the ways that we serve. Paul talks about in Acts 16.6 6, that the Holy Spirit was preventing them from going in one direction, was leading them in another direction as an example. All the ministries that we carry out in the church are carried out in the power and the direction of the, of the Lord's word and His Spirit. Uh, the Spirit helps us in our prayers. Romans chapter 8, 26, Paul tells us, we don't pray as we should, the Spirit helps us in our prayer life. And the Spirit also provides the power for our resurrection. Romans chapter 8, 10, 11, you know, uh, Paul is saying, if the Spirit that was in Christ is in you, in the same way that the Spirit raised Christ from the dead, that same Spirit is going to raise you from the dead. And so the Holy Spirit powers our, our resurrection as He powered the resurrection of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit works all things in the world and in our personal lives for the good of the church of which Christ is the only head. You know that thing, that, that verse that says all things work for good? You know, we mangle that poor verse over and over again, thinking all things work for good, oh boy, I got a new car. You know, all things go work for good, oh, I found a parking spot you know, near the door. You know. All things work for who's good? God's good. And what does God want? Well, God wants every person to be saved. He wants every person to come to the knowledge of Christ. All things are working for that good. That's the good. That's why sometimes we, we can't understand, you know, wait a minute, I broke my leg and then I lost my job and then my dog died and so on and so forth. Where's the good? I can't see the good here. You know, well, this is, you're looking in the wrong place for the good. You're looking for the wrong good. All right. So as I say, the Holy Spirit works all things, all things in the world and in our personal lives together for the good of the church, for the good of the gospel, for the good of accomplishing God's will. In this way, we can offer our broken leg and our lost job and our dead dog, we can offer it all to God and say, please use all of this, Father, for your will in some way to achieve your purpose, not my purpose. All right, so that's one idea of leadership. Um, the second idea on leadership is this. First idea, the head and leader of the church is Jesus Christ. Second idea, the responsibility to exercise the leadership of the Lord in the local assembly belongs to the elders. Okay. On his first missionary journey, Paul establishes churches in Lystra and Iconium, and upon his return, he appoints elders in the church. And Luke writes that having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord. In Acts 14, verse 23, there it is, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord whom they had believed. Now the word commended here means to place alongside. So these men were placed alongside of whom? Well, they were placed alongside of Jesus in order to exercise the leadership that He expresses in the New Testament. This procedure is repeated again in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul instructs this evangelist to appoint elders as well. He says, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So you know, even the words used to describe this role in the New Testament suggest the exercising of leadership. It's all about leadership. Okay? For example, in Acts 20, 28, Paul is talking uh, to the elders, um, and giving them instructions, and he refers to them as uh, pastors, and he says that they should shepherd the flock. And so, uh, what do you think when you think of shepherd? 
you know, uh, there's a flock of sheep and there's a shepherd. Who's the leader here? You know, you know what I'm saying? The, the idea of a shepherd is the idea that he leads and is responsible for the, for the flock. And so to refer to an individual in the church as a shepherd conjures up the idea that that individual is responsible for the flock, responsible for other people. Another word is used, the oversee, to oversee. Uh, sometimes, uh, depending on your translation, they use the word bishop. Um, interesting word, this word originally meant to overshadow in reference to the bright cloud at the transfiguration, you know, when Jesus was transfigured, that word is used as the cloud that came over them. And so the idea is that the overseer's responsibility casts his shadow, a benevolent shadow, over the church. A lot of times we, we see the word overseer and we're thinking, oh, supervisor, strong boss, you know, manager. And that's not quite, hmm, it's not precise enough to give the full meaning of this word. Okay? Someone that, that, you know the, to hover over something? A hen that covers her chicks? That, that's more in line with this, with this word. To, to be over in the sense of, okay, I'm up here and you're down there. This is not, this is the human thinking. The spiritual idea is to be over in a benevolent sense, still with authority, but the idea of a benevolent sense of being over something. And then, of course, the other word, elder, presbyter, Acts 20, 17, of course, meant someone who was older, or wiser. Originally, this word was used to refer to the patriarchs in the Old Testament, also used to refer to those who were leaders in the Sanhedrin, you know, the Jewish ruling body, in Matthew 16, verse 21. I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea here. A lot of, there's a lot of preaching and a lot of teaching that I've heard that tries in some way to minimize the power, or minimize rather the authority of the elders. So a lot of the teaching is slanted toward the idea, well, they don't really have any authority. They just, you know, they lead by example and they lead by a benevolent acts. And that's not so. All the words used to describe what we call elders in the church all have a component of leadership in there, of responsibility, of authority. Okay? Also, the Holy Spirit says, that the church has a responsibility in reaction to elders, in reaction to these individuals. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13, Paul writes again, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you. So the appreciation comes from the congregation. The diligent laboring is provided by the, by the elders. And he says, and have charge over you. Again, responsibility, authority, in the Lord, and give you instruction. Who gives the instruction? Uh, the elders are giving instruction. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work, and live in peace with, with one another. So there are the instructions for the individuals and how, how we as a congregation respond to uh, to uh, elders, that we appreciate the hard work that they do, uh, that we understand and accept the charge that they have, and by whom it's been given. The Lord has given them a charge. They're responsible to Him. And who gives the instruction? The elders give the instructions. And that you esteem them highly in love because of their work. Uh, and then another uh, passage, uh, Hebrews 13, 17, a little more direct this time, pretty hard to twist this any other way. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. There's the perfect balance. It's not a one-way street. It's not just, okay, you need to obey the elders, period. He's very careful here in, in, in giving a two-part 
admonition, one to the congregation, you need to follow the leadership, you need to follow the instructions of the elders. And I mean, we can put in quotations, of course, as they lead us in the Lord, if the elders say, okay, we're going to quit communion, we're not going to take communion anymore, and we're not really thinking that Jesus is the Son of God, well, you know, we have a problem with those elders and their teaching. So we understand that idea. As they, as they lead us in the spirit and in the teaching of the Lord, of course. So on the one side he says, obey your leaders, be in submission to them, yes, and then for the leaders they say, for they keep watch over your soul as those who will give an account. So there's a rendering on both sides. You know, those who follow will be judged in their following, and those who lead, they'll be judged in their leading. Okay, so there's a well-balanced thing here. And it says, let them do this with joy and not with grief. How do they do it with joy? Well, as the congregation follows and submits and appreciates and loves and follows the instructions. And then he says, for this would be unprofitable for you. There's the warning to the congregation. So suffice to say that the, the New Testament teaches us that Jesus, He is the leader and He is the authority in the church. And His leadership is embodied in the Word and the Holy Spirit, but it is exercised in the human form through uh, the eldership. All right, now there are several reasons why I wanted to emphasize the leadership aspect of the elder's role. First of all, the Bible teaches that elders um, have leadership. The Bible itself teaches that the responsibility of leadership in the church rests with the elders. You know, all the scriptures that relate to them, whether it is describing their work or describing their qualifications or referring to them in a narrative, doesn't matter how the Bible is referring to elders or bishops or you know, however it refers to them, uh, it always puts them in the leadership role. For example, I want to read a passage here in Acts chapter 15, verses one to six. It says, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders, notice, the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The debate over circumcision saw the, elder, uh, the apostles, but you ever notice every time they mentioned the apostles, they always said the apostles and the elders were discussing what needed to be done. Okay? Now we're not going to get into the whole thing about circumcision here, I'm just wanting to use this passage to demonstrate that the elders were mentioned in the same breath as the apostles when it came to decision making and leadership in that particular congregation. So when we skip down to verse 22 after the debate and so on and so forth, the conclusion uh, in verse 22, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas, and Silas leading men among the brethren. The idea was that the apostles and the elders discussed the situation, came to a conclusion and a resolution, and then formulated instructions for the church in Antioch that, were, that was brought to Antioch with Paul, uh, by Paul and Barnabas. Okay. So I want us here to understand that we believe and teach that God's word establishes the elders as the leaders in the local assembly. This is not tradition. You know, it's not, oh, you guys in the Church of Christ, that's how you do it. No, no, that, that's, this, is, this is the biblical structure of leadership in the local assembly. 
another reason to emphasize the elders' leadership is to guard against the errors of denominationalism. Okay? Way back in the first century, Paul warned the elders from Ephesus that they would be, there would be division and apostasy in Acts chapter 20. The New Testament church has had to battle against man-made ideas concerning this particular doctrine and its organization from the very beginning. Nothing new here. This has been the debate from the start. One such organizational change has been the shift from an elder-centered church to a preacher-centered church. That's one of the things that even in our brotherhood has occurred. When you read through the New Testament, you notice that originally the elders led through teaching and example, through devotion, through service, through ministry, to the unfaithful and the ill. For example, in James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, it says, is any one of you sick? Then he must call for the, who? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. In other words, the elders are ministering to him the entire gamut of that person's needs. His physical ailment, of course, but apparently here some spiritual problems, um, some spiritual problems as well. In most denominations, and unfortunately, even in some of our congregations, we have left this particular model for one that sees the preacher as the main teacher, the main leader, the main minister, and the elders many times as some sort of governing board of decision makers. And the most common phrase we hear, well, we're going to have to run that by the elders. Like there's some sort of committee, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Well, paint the building, yes. You know, uh, pave the parking lot, no. You know, up and down. That's, that's not how the church will, was designed. The church was not designed to revolve around one individual with a particular skill. You notice that in some congregations where the the, the, the very uh, dynamic uh, preacher, for example, he's the, he's the wow, he's the you know, chief operating officer of that particular congregation. Nothing happens without his say so. He's the boss, you know, and everything revolves around him. And uh, believe it or not, that's an easier way to run a church. <laughs> you got one boss, he controls everything. But it's also an easier way to make a church blow up too. And I will simply say because it's an unbiblical approach to church uh, leadership. Now I'm going to have a lesson on the role of the preacher in the, in the weeks to come. And I think you'll see that it's not what many of us have known or assumed in our, in our church life. The church you know, can grow using man-made methods. I mean, you know, add instruments, gimmicks, get a charismatic preacher-centered church. These things have demonstrated that they'll grow numbers. But our call is not to be a big church. Our mission is to be the church of the Bible. And that's not sour grapes. That's not making excuses for non-growth. I personally believe and I personally have experienced the fact that a biblically centered church and a biblically organized church and a, a church that functions according to the scriptures is a growing church. It is a growing church. Usually when a church is shrinking or falling down and so on and so forth, it's not because it's operating according to the scriptures, it's usually the opposite reason that it's not a, a going according to the scripture. Maybe the structure might be there, but the spirit isn't there. So I, I believe that God is, is pleased more with purity in the church than numbers in the, in the church. Numbers are just too easy to manipulate. So the church of the Bible has the elders as the focal point of leadership and ministry, 
teaching, nurturing, counseling, not the pulpit minister, not the youth minister, not the deacons, or any type of committee. Okay, one other reason for this emphasis on leadership, and that is to challenge our own congregation here. Some of you are watching this lesson live, others are watching online, and still others will watch it in the future uh, on our website, on the church website, or Bible Talk website, or you'll get a video of it, or whatever. These are very personal lessons because they're dealing with issues that directly affect us. I'm talking about our church too. I'm not talking about some church out there or the church in general. I really am talking about us, our eldership, our preachers, our deacons, our members, who will have to respond to these lessons in some way. So these lessons, you know, they're a bit risky because if there's no change, you know, if, if no one rises up to the challenge that I'll be making, then it'll be evident to everybody. You know? uh, it'll be our quiet little truth that we all heard what we needed to do, where we needed to go, how we needed to change, but we didn't do it. So you know, the challenge is out there. More specifically, I'm teaching about the leadership aspect of elders because it'll challenge three groups. First of all, the elders themselves will recognize more emphatically the importance and the scope of their role. Secondly, the congregation will realize who God has put in place to lead here. And when there's you know, rebelling or murmuring against the elders, uh, we need to understand that we're doing that against God's will. So we need to be very careful what we say among ourselves. We understand that uh, you know, our leaders, our elders, you know, they're not perfect. Uh, we, we understand that idea, but let's not make a sport out of judging their imperfections. And then thirdly, uh, those who need to consider serving as elders. You know, we need to identify and cultivate men to serve as elders um, now and into the future. You know, all church growth studies um, tell us that you need one elder for about every 40 adults. Think about that, one elder for every, about every 40 adults for a church to function effectively. So we have almost 400 people, and not everybody's here all the time, but we have almost 400, 400 people here. Also, um, it takes time for an elder to uh, grow into his role. It's, you know, we've been here when we've you know, inducted new elders, we've appointed or assigned or commended new elders, and it's, all, it's a wonderful thing, you know? but you don't go from not being an elder to all of a sudden being an elder and having all that wisdom and all that ability to make decisions and so on and so forth overnight. It's, a, it's very much a learned activity, and it takes time. So you know, it, it's not like in, a, in the office world or you know, somebody retires and you hire somebody and they take their place and we keep on going. Here, if one of our elders retires, we don't just grab one, somebody from the pew and say, okay, now you're an elder and you're going to be able to do all his work. No. No, elders take you know, a long period of gestation, if you wish, long period of training and so on and so forth to really begin to be effective as, as elders. So that's why I'm always calling out to men in the church you know, to you know, encourage you to step up and consider uh, serving in this way. Uh, God's call to surrender your life to Him in sincere service through the eldership. Uh, we know that none are worthy. Uh, we, we understand that. God doesn't say, okay, you must be worthy. Well, what does He say? He says, if you're willing, he can work with someone who's willing, because none, none of us are worthy, absolutely not. So these lessons on elders and preachers and deacons and saints are not just information meetings. There's a strategy here, there's a training sessions that will help us as a group uh, as we press on to maturity in appointing and developing leaders at every point of service in our congregation. Okay, that's our lesson for today. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention.